My name is Georg Schroth. I'm one of the co-founders of Navis, and uh, definitely thanks for the invitation. Pleasure to be here. And the presentation that I will give is about dynamic laser scanning. And of course, when preparing this presentation, I was thinking, what are probably the questions that you guys have? And that's why we actually reached out to you and tried to find out, OK, what are the questions? I hope you have seen it. We definitely got a lot of responses and to see basically what's interesting for you. So I try to cluster this a little bit into two main things. One is more on the market and uh, what are the major trends that are influencing us these days. And the other one specifically on the dynamic laser scanning part as such. So let's dive into that. So the first thing that you will probably notice is that there's a huge amount of uh, changes these days. And that definitely requires quite some smart decisions to be able to really um, yeah, stay on top of things. And um, this is actually now the question, like how to stay on top of things with the many things that are happening. Just if you look at the, um, at the, the fair here, then of course, um, it's an, uh, quite an amount of information that is driving on us. But um, one of the key things that are really um, influencing us is for sure um, the rising interest rates. Right? You all for sure know about it's the thing all around the world. And one thing that is definitely happening from that is that the greenfield um, residential construction is coming down. I think I see some nodding heads. That's definitely happening. For sure, this is something that is not being forever. There are people that need homes, but yet there will be some dip, of course. On the other hand, we see an increase in brownfield projects. So why is that? Well, it has a couple of reasons. One of that is actually that the governmental aids are tr uh, subsidizing that. So they try to get the industry back into the country, but they are also having another interest, and that is about reducing carbon emissions. That was really like a nice to have not too long ago, but it became part of the contracts already. And it's really like if we look into contracts of our customers, we see them that they have to do something about that. And the reason is, that actually if you look into uh, construction, then of course the concrete, the production of the concrete emits as much CO2 as pretty much any kind of heating, airplanes and cars all together. Sometimes overlooked, but it's super important to know. And that's why the governmental aids are aiming to reduce teardowns where you need to replace it with new concrete, but are rather focusing on renovations and brownfield projects. And you know it, for brownfield projects, you need as is data to plan how you will actually build on top of your existing building. Yeah, and then there's another sector, obviously, that has a lot of money these days, and that is actually the energy sector. You can imagine why they have a lot of money these days, but they also have a challenging future ahead. They don't know exactly how their future will look like, but they know it's not going to be the same as the last few years, where an oil and gas company has been primarily about oil and gas. And so to be able to plan the future, they need to know about their assets. They need to plan this, they need to therefore scan it. And that's why we see a huge increase in the oil and gas sector that is actually about reality capture and definitely worth talking to them. So you see, there's quite a bit about the industry and I would love to touch more upon this and I'm happy to do this in a personal interaction, but in the interest of time, I would also like to touch a little bit upon um, how we as an industry um, are competing with each other and how we are influencing each other. And it's for sure not an easy thing, but if you if you look at it, um, it's definitely that the prices for standard services has been steadily coming down. It is not just something that happened over the last one year, but over the last few years, standard services, the prices have been coming down. And with that, that means that the margins are becoming smaller and smaller and too small without changing your workflow. Now, if you look at the margins, you basically want to check how your costs are to improve them because the prices are coming by competition. So and if you look at the cost, there are initial investments that are coming from yeah, us buying a scanner like that. And then there's, of course, recurring costs that are coming from personnel, from workflows. And personnel, as you know, is not getting cheaper these days. Inflation makes them rather more expensive. So it's definitely worth looking into this. So if you compete with a setup like that, you probably have two problems. The first is you might think, hey, the setup is already de deprecated or written off for several years, might not be the newest. And so it must be relatively cheap, but it's not. You're using spheres. You're probably not using infield registration. That means that you're rather slow, and that means that you have a rather high personal cost. And that makes your square meter price high, and then you're losing your jobs to the competition. Second problem is you're not considered innovative anymore by your clients because your client knows that there's things like infield registration, and they also know about dynamic laser scanning these days. It's nothing new. It's not a new kit on the block. They still consider this as innovative, don't get me wrong, but it's something that they already require you to do 
in the contracts, in the, in the RFPs, they say, this project you can only win if you use dynamic laser scanning. We have seen this already quite a few times. So you see just by the color of the units that they have been used a lot, it's not that they are kind of just shown around. So why is that? Because they also help you on the other problem, which is the labor cost. They save you immense amount of time in the field and in the office because the workflow is automated and therefore easier. So, but speaking about reducing the time, the infield time, you can say that's good for me because I save money through labor costs. But of course, um, there is much more into that because um, your clients, they have productive facilities like factories, logistics centers, warehouses, whatever, schools, hospitals. And there's a lot of people working there. And if you interrupt their work, that means that they lose a lot of money. So it's not only about the person that you're saving that takes less time, but it's also about your client that is not interrupted as much. And that's a real, real pain and a real money saver for your clients if you show them that there will be less interruptions. So ultimately, a VLX2, for instance, can help you on two things. First, if you think about the initial investments, a VLX2 is actually cheaper or lower cost in the initial investments than a good TLS. And the second, it will save you on the field work, means like on the recurring cost on the euro per square meter. So overall, before you buy another TLS, really think twice if you shouldn't invest into dynamic scanning. So this is about the market and the competition. Let's look now directly into the dynamic laser scanning as such. And you'll see that um, there is obvious questions that I hopefully am able to answer, and that is how is a VLX3 and true different from a TLS and also from other dynamic scanners. And let me answer this with this video. Hopefully it's working uh, for process facility. Yeah, now oh, of course. Thank you. Um, and the first one that's obvious is about speed, right? This thing is <laughs> a lot faster, five to ten times faster than you would do it with a TLS. And this is a point cloud from a VLX, right? And that will probably bring you to the other aspect, which is accuracy. Yeah. <laughs> so um, if you look at this point cloud, I think you already noticed that there's an order of magnitude of a difference between a VLX point cloud and any other data dynamic mobile scanning device that you know about. It's a huge difference. Sometimes it's even hard to spot the difference to a ter terrestrial laser scanning system. And so the modeling is also very fast. Then, of course, completeness. So I think there's no way that you can place um, a realistic amount of setups of a TLS to make, to make sure that you don't have any um, gaps or uh, are incomplete. And that would be the risk that you have to come back to the site, which is extremely expensive and is extremely time consuming. So completeness is a thing. If you have 1.3 million points per second, like the VLX3, if you take a panorama every one or two meters, you're relatively sure that you never have to come back to the site. And then there's one thing that is typically overlooked, which is simplicity. Simplicity could be a nice to have, but you could also consider that as such. Simplicity means you're making sure that you don't make mistakes even on a long day. And mistakes are what really takes time. So overall, um, that's definitely um, hopefully giving you an idea about the difference between TLS um, and a VLX3 and also dynamic scanners. So if I look into now the eyes of many of um, the people that I've met today, they are not wondering anymore if they should invest into dynamic scanning. That's mainly a given now. You see so many, like basically no vendor that I know that believes um, that they are technology leaders does not offer you dynamic scanner anymore. So they all believe that you will eventually come to the conclusion that this is the future. However, then there's a very fair question, which is now when to I invest? And actually, if you look at this portfolio from, for instance, Hexagon, you see there's a new scanner every year. So when is it really the right time to invest? But this is actually, I think, the wrong question, because the question should be rather, what to invest to? Because if you invest into hardware, yes, this hardware will be outdated rather soon, maybe. But if you, if you invest into a product that is mainly driven by software, right, the software will be updated, and it will keep your investment valid. And that's why our core philosophy at Navis is that we want to invest into software as much as we potentially can. And that gives you a picture here that um, the first, very first Alpha VLX that was not sold, just internal, from 2019 is still running the very same software as the latest and greatest of our products that we are just shipping. And that means that the point cloud that you see here um, from our um, newest software on the oldest device, so the 2019 device from us is still showing you a better point cloud than any dynamic mobile mapping system that you see released on this show today. 
So that tells you something. So this device is still up to date despite um, being already, could have been purchased in 2019. So it's pretty incredible how to see the improvements there. So then there's, of course, always the, uh, also the question, and that's a tricky one, when are they not the right tools? And let me try to answer this as well with a picture. I think this is a nice example. When you really want to scan such detailed objects, like thin pipes that are two or three centimeters in diameter, and want to make sure that you get the precise diameter, then you need to have a TLS for that. And you don't need just any TLS, you need a good TLS, you need to place it relatively close to that to be able to get enough points on that pipe to really measure the diameter. Same with the valves. There are other scenarios for sure, but this I think are the most important two. So the second one would be, if you're in a completely open area, 50 meters around you, there's absolutely nothing, not even a tree, then the VLX will have a hard time being able to precisely track its position. But that's where you can use a drone or a static, uh, sorry, a total station. And this is exactly the point. There must be the right tool for the right job. And what we have to make sure is that you make them interoperable. And that's why we are trying to work with open formats like EFT7, try to make it compatible with all kind of workflows, get control points from any kind of total station into our system to make sure that this works. Last question and I'll try to be hopefully quick on that one, is what is the ROI of a Navis VLX really? So that's obviously very, very difficult to answer, and you have to make assumptions on that because it depends on the project. Um, what we have done is actually we built a little calculator that you can try yourself, go to us, and then we will guide you through that, and very put your own assumptions into that. It's completely transparent on what we have done, how we compare this. You can change everything, but it's giving you an easy time of doing it. So I tried this and put a couple of assumptions, not all of them I can put on the slide, but some of them can. So I compared the VLX with a TLS that has modern in-field registration. It has 30 setups per hour. Labor cost 25 euros per hour. Of course, it could be more. And you could have done also more setups, but that's not really the, the thing if you do nine hours a day. Colored point cloud in E57 with Panos and around 300,000 square meters of work volume. It could be less, it could be more. It doesn't really matter so much. Um, actually, I can tell you that a VLX customer does around three to four times more because they can take more projects and they are getting more projects than if you had just a TLS. Now, let's look into these three examples. One is a single office, 2,000 square meters. You see we're around 2.4 times faster in the field. Why is only 2.4? Because you still have to get to the side, you still have to open the doors, you still have to say hello. All that is the same for the TLS and the, um, the mobile scanner, so it's only two and a four times. But 57% um, labor cost, that's telling you something. And uh, if you got a really good deal for your TLS, then you're still ending up at 27% total cost reduction. Let's look at the building, 5,000 square meters. Here, if you consider you have to get to the site, you have to prepare it, I argue this 5,000 square meters is too much for one person, one TLS to do in one day. So you have to actually have to do a couple things twice. And I assume that this uh, project is very close by, so it doesn't really matter so much. But imagine that's in a different city. Then this will be looking a lot better for the VLX, of course, even better. Still 68% um, cost reduction in labor cost. Last but not least, the school. 10,000 square meters, by the way, all real scenarios. And here, um, with 10,000 square meters, I would argue you always should use control points with a total station, right? Um, you can do it without it, but also with a TLS, I would definitely argue it's a good thing to do. And um, in this case, 3.65% um, um, uh, times faster, 70% labor cost reduction, and above 30% total cost. So I would like to end it with a question. In times like these, can you really afford to not save 30% on your total costs, right? So I touched on quite a few topics, I know. I would love to discuss them at our booth. would like to invite you to come over and to discuss them with me. Certainly, uh, some of them have been provocative, but that's exactly what I want. I want to start a discussion. And with that, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to build a better reality together with you. Thank you very much.